with the sheaves of ripe and gray. Far and near their gold is gleaming o'er the sunny slope and plain. Lord of harvest sat for three reapers here, us Lord to thee we cry. Send them now the sheaves to gather here, the harvest time pass by. Send them forth with morn's first beaming send them in the noontide's glare, when the sun's last rays are streaming bid them gather everywhere. Lord of harvest, sat for three reapers here, us Lord to thee we cry, send them now the sheaves to gather here, the Let's turn to hymn number 608, Faith is the Victory. This is our Faith Camp theme song. We invite all of you to stand. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise. And press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread, and echo with a shout. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that oh overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night. In Jesus' conquering name, faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. You may be seated. Then. 
Okay, we have uh, just one, I think, one announcement, and that is for the youth at 1.30 today. There will be a youth activity, and youth, by youth, we mean all ages. So anyone that feels like a youth can be a youth. And where are they meeting you, Gabriel, in the, in the lobby? In the lobby out there at 1.30. So lunch will be at 12.30, and then at 1.30 the youth will meet in the lobby for the youth activity. And um, it'll be interesting to see what God has you guys do today and what he tells Gabe to have you guys do today. <laughs> All right, well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we will turn the time over to Auntie Gail. Dear Father in heaven, we just want to thank you that you always challenge us to come closer to you. You always ask us to choose you more and more and more. And so we ask, Father, that you would pour your spirit upon us now, that you would give us hearts that are soft to hear your voice calling to us, and that you will fill us with your spirit right now. Please feel Gail also and help her to speak for you. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy you made it out here. And I must say that I am so happy to be here because we've been traveling like nobody's business since June 9. And as um, uh, Ramon has told you, we've all had our experiences. His is a topper more than anyone else. But for me, I am just so delighted to be with these missionaries and travel this far and get exhausted together and then get enthused together. And uh, we complement each other. You know, we work in different areas of God's vineyard and we know about each other, but we really don't know each other. And so during this time, we have uh, really, really been able to um, be filled with the Holy Spirit because it grows, you know, as we um, get close together and Jesus draws our hearts close together and to you too because God has great things in store for all of us together and none of us are any higher than anybody else. We're all at the foot of the cross finding out what does God want me to do in these last days. And so for me today, I want to talk about hearing God's voice. To hear his voice. Now to me, this is the most important thing in the world, over and above, way over and above everything else. Because if we can't hear God's voice, then he can't come close to us and we can't follow him. So in order to have friends on this earth, we talk together. But in order to be with Jesus, we need to hear his voice. Um, it's not just us that are pouring our hearts out to him. He wants to pour his heart out to us. And if we're not listening, he can't tell us. So how horrible is it to go through a whole week or a day or a minute when Jesus wants to say something to us, but he cannot because we're not listening. And you know, in John 10, 27, it says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And so it takes to people to communicate, for God to know us and for us to follow him. We will follow him because we taste and see that he's so good. And in Revelation 14, 4, it says, and they followed the lamb whithersoever he goeth. That's the redeemed. That's the 144,000 in heaven. And if we're going to follow him there, we must first follow him here. And so today, this morning, I want to give you my testimony, basically, of not me, but what God has tried to get through to me all this time. So I just want to praise the Lord because, you know, the only reason I can stand before you healthy and in one piece is because God has saved my life. At least nine times I can tell you I should have died. And so God must have more work for me to do. And uh, this summer it's to go out and join with Jesus for Asia and this group and travel America and do these, these um, faith camps. And what a blessing it is. So uh, when 
I was a child, uh, and growing up, I put Jesus first in my life, but I didn't really know what that looked like. But later, after I got married and I lived in the country in Montana, I had moved from Tennessee to Montana, and my husband had to be gone for a long time. And uh, I was having a very difficult time. It was uh, in November of 1999, and soon it was going to be Y2K. Remember that? In uh, year 2000, and I was alone with a three-year-old and a five-year-old. And I was in a place that I didn't really understand where it got deathly cold in the winter and neighbors were telling me your car won't start and it's going to be y2k and you need to be ready for any emergency and then other people i was really really suffering through that time and so one night i was traumatized by many things and i put my children to bed and i walked the driveway we're in the in the mountains in the country beautiful and i'm but i'm walking the driveway and i'm crying and i'm talking to jesus and uh, I just want to hear his voice. I just want to know, what does he think of me? I don't think anybody else thinks much of me. But I want to hear his voice. And so I walk and I cry and I walk and I talk to God. Well, you know, God has something to say to me. And so finally I decide I need to go back in and I'll read my next chapter because I'm reading through the Bible and I will read the next, next chapter and go to sleep. So I went in the house feeling like, you know, feelings are horrible. Don't listen to them. I think the ceiling like is brass above my head and God doesn't care or think or just not there. I go in the house and I open my Bible. I'm on third John. And so I open the Bible to third John. And it's all I see is light coming from verse 14. I shall shortly see thee and we shall speak face to face. And it wasn't as if I was just reading the verse. It was like he was saying it to me. And if you could just feel that moment when God's voice was clear to me and how my burden just nothing else matters. When Jesus talks to you, you are revived. You are fine. We can never be made miserable when we're in the presence of Jesus. And so these words to me mean so much. Because, you know, nobody can see God face to face and live, right? So if I'm going to see Jesus face to face, won't I be in heaven with Jesus? And so everything in my life, when it's depressing and discouraging, I think about this time. Jesus, when he hung on the cross, he thought about the time his father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And he gives you and me his voice of comfort today so that when this great crisis strikes, like an overwhelming surprise, which it's soon going to do, you can reflect on these things and you can be strong because we want to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and the things that he has told us all along. Let the churches be aroused. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This message concerns all our churches. You can never employ your faculty of hearing better than in hearkening to hear what the voice of God speaks to you in his word. We must fight the good of fight of faith to the very end. And you know, it's, you can realize how important that is to you, the prayer and the Bible, because God speaks through that, and we know it because the devil He's fighting our very moment with God and our prayers and the Bible. The mastermind in the confederacy of evil is ever working to keep out of sight the words of God and to bring human opinions into view. He tries to keep us from hearing the voice of God, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. He is doing his utmost to obscure heaven's light. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'm so encouraged with these words. Now, my whole foundation of my life and my missionary life and everything comes from my mother. And when I was a little girl, I can remember my father was a pastor and my mother, well, my mother was like Jesus. I remember from the very smallest childhood that I looked at my mother and thought she was Jesus. My mother never got angry. She never got upset. And my sister and I, we never fought and we never had an argument. We always got along. 
very well. From three years old, we wanted to be missionary nurses. And my father was a pastor, and back in those days, they were starched white shirts. And uh, so when dad would throw his shirts away, Lynn and I, we would get the shirt out of the trash and cut the sleeve off the cuff, and it made a very perfect nurse's cap. And then we would wear that shirt, and our dolls would be the patients, and we'd be missionary nurses. And my doll was always the patient because I was a little more rough on my toys than she was. And as we were growing up, my mother, she read Child Guidance through seven times when she was raising my sister and I, because you can't do Child Guidance without God's miraculous power to uh, make those things come true. She taught us the Bible. We learned to memorize scripture. In fact, at a young age, we could both recite the whole book of Daniel and Revelation. And though I couldn't tell you verse by verse, it has helped me my whole life through because these chapters, though I didn't understand them then, the words and the importance of it has grown throughout the years. And mother would read us mission stories. She would read us many, many mission stories. We lived in a rented farmhouse at one time, and it had uh, 250 acres around it, and my sister and I, we loved it. My mother didn't like it so well because the ceilings were 12 foot high, and the wallpaper was vivid. Roses and flowers and wild things and pipes were across the ceiling that you couldn't clean. And, but to us, it was a sanctuary. Um, one day, my sister and I, something must have just disturbed the Holy Spirit in our home, and Mother sent us out to have a worship in the woods. And my sister, she chose a spot in the back in the pine thicket. I went to the right, and I found a stump that I sat on. And there we would read the Bible and pray and sing. And it would become a habit for us every morning. We'd get up, and we'd go to our little spot in the woods, and we'd have our worship with God. And I remember I would always come back singing, Holy Thine, Holy Thine, O Lord. This is my plea. And uh, when I was eight years old, I told something to my mother that must have shocked her. I didn't ask her later what she thought about it, but I said to her, I was eight years old, and I said to my mother, Mother, I think I need to die now. And my mother said, Why do you think you should die now? And I said, Because I know Jesus now, and I'm close to Jesus, but I notice when people get older, they do bad things and, and things that uh, Jesus doesn't want them to do, and I don't want to get like that, so I think I should die. But it wasn't God's will for me to die right then. God had a plan for my life, and though I haven't always done the things that please him, he has helped me through and I have been able to hear his voice here and there, nowhere near as much as what he wanted to talk to me about. But uh, to hear his voice is, uh, has been the light of my life. Later, I got married, and I had two boys. And uh, we moved, like I said, from Tennessee to Montana and to homeschool the boys. And it was a good life in the country. But things didn't always go so well. So before I continue in my talk, I want to say a little prayer. You can bow your heads. Dear Lord in heaven, we know the devil fights us every minute of our life, but we know that greater is he that is in us than in the world. Please bless this presentation with your words and with the power that only you can give because our hearts are thirsty. We want to hear your voice. We want to taste and see how good you are today. So thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so it was December 25, uh, two, uh, 2008. It was Christmas Day, December 25, 2008, when my husband told me he was leaving me. Well, for me, it was a shock. I knew nothing about it. And it is so amazing how that in one short sentence and five seconds of time or less, your whole world can drop to the floor and shatter into millions of pieces at your feet. And me, like most human beings, you reach out for human sympathy and support and somebody to understand or help you. 
And so as the days went by, I found out it wasn't just leave me that day, but he had really left two years before that. But this is the very first time that I heard about this. Now, I needed a father for my children. They're now 13 and 15. And so this counselor, an, a pastor, retired pastor, took us up as a project. And of course, it's always the best, you think, to keep the family together. And that's what I wanted with all my heart. So I'm to forgive and to do all these things to make this work. And so I have no problem forgiving. It's not a problem at all. My problem is that he's chosen the wrong route. He is on the wide path. And, uh, and uh, then my boys, what will it do to them? And so I'm forgiving and I'm trying to carry on, but I'm losing a little more weight every day. I'm dying a little bit more every single day. Well, four months rolled by. And one day, I'm in the pasture behind my house. It's a big farmhouse in Montana. And I'm at the hay bales. And as I'm going back towards the house, I hear God's voice, loud and clear, the loudest ever in my life. And this is what it said. Ephraim is joined to his idols. Leave him alone. And I was shocked because all this time, I'm listening to human voices, and I'm to stay, but this is God, and he's telling me to leave, leave him alone. And so as I'm, cons I'm thinking about this voice, my whole heart and my whole life is turned around 180 degrees. I cannot stay, but what am I going to do? And so there at the kitchen table, I sat all night. And you know, I want to tell you something C.S. Lewis said one time. God whispers to our conscience. He speaks to our joy, and he shouts to our pain. It's true. And so at that table, I cry and I pray, much like I did in the driveway, only way harder and way more fervent. And as I sat there that night, in the middle of the night, I started to write a poem. And I don't write poetry. You cross it out and you try again and the rhythm and the rhyme is wrong and you go again and again. But this time, I just wrote the poem because it wasn't me writing it. It was God himself saying to me, let Jesus take control of your life. And there at the kitchen table that night, in the dark part of the night, Jesus took control of my life. And the most wonderful blessing to me lately has been that Jonathan has heard this poem and me talk about it before. And he and Hannah, his wife, are very musical. And he composed a song to this poem. And they've been so gracious to agree to sing it to us today. Thank you. struggles, fears, and doubts. When life's fierce storms oppress my soul and I am tossed about. Oh dear Jesus, my control, the darkness you erase. You guide my feet toward the goal. You whisper by my grace. Oh, dear 
Jesus, take control. My life is but a threat. The skies are dark and billows roll, and I am filled with dread. Oh, dear Jesus, my control, the darkness you feet toward the goal, you whisper by my grace. Oh, dear Jesus, take control. I see you through my tears. Your look of love, you're all in all. Oh, please forgive my fears. Oh, dear Jesus, my control, the darkness you erase. You guide my feet toward the goal. You whisper by my grace. Oh, dear Jesus, take control. This long night has an end. You're always here, you're in control. On you I will depend. Oh, dear Jesus, my control. Through fiery trials you trace. Your work for good, your future plan, to see me face to face. Oh, dear Jesus, my control, the darkness you erase. You guide my feet toward the goal. You whisper by my grace. You whisper by my so much. And you know, from that night on, Jesus took control of my life. And you know, he might have probably wanted to tell me that four months ago, if only I had been listening. But he shouted this out to me. And you know, before you call, he will answer. And uh, it means so much. It's the motto of my life. Jesus, take control. In fact, I have that as my email address, jesustakecontrol at gmail.com. And uh, in my Bible, somebody uh, did my Bible for me, and they put the verse here, I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. So God is so special. He is so beautiful and so lovely for us. I, through this time, time period and thereafter, I've had hard times, you've had hard times, and probably harder than I've had. But in it all, there's got to be a reason for the suffering that humans go through. Our suffering is not for nothing because God has a purpose in everything that he allows to happen to us. In fact, suffering could be defined by wanting what you don't have or not having what you want. That could probably cover every kind of suffering. And from the smallest things that make you say, oh no, I have a flat tire, or to the big things like adultery or murder or the times when you just lose everything in life. We still have a loving Heavenly Father and the stunning message through all our suffering is that God loves us. He has a purpose, and he will never leave us or forsake us. So when something bad 
happens to us, we tend to shrink from that. But just like sometimes people give us gifts and we don't really want them, but the right thing to do is to say thank you, even though you something you absolutely don't need and don't want. But God gives us what we need. It's not always to, according to our tastes or preferences, but it is what he knows is for our good. And our suffering is never for nothing because out of it comes good that can give life to the world, to others. You know, um, we can accept the bad times and our suffering, and we can say thank you to God for it. Because when people give us a gift that we don't want, we just do the nice thing and say thank you. But for God, we know it's for our best good, so we can accept it, and we can say thank you. You know, Paul uh, once said that this thorn in the flesh that he got that day, he said, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. In other words, who gave it to him? It came from God. Jesus himself said, the cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And so that hard time is something coming from God. And we can do four things. We can accept it. We can thank God for it. And we can hold it as a sacrifice, a gift to give back to Jesus. And with it, we can give ourselves. Because we know that this is not just for us. It's for the gift of the world. And you know, it says... In Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, wilt thou not despise. In other words, this is a gift that we can give back to Jesus. We can accept it and thank him for it and give it to him as an offering. You know, the children of Israel gave offerings all the time. They brought their sheep or their ox or something to sacrifice to God because of their sin or because of everything. That's their communication with God. And God gives us things today. And the blessings, sure, it's easy to thank God for all the blessings when the windows of heaven open and pour us out a blessing. But it's something that doesn't come natural to thank him for the hard times. But it says here that God will not despise it. In fact, we can rejoice in these hard things. In all things give thanks, for this is the will of God for you. And Paul said, that he rejoiced in his sufferings for the people. And Jesus said in Hebrews 12, 2, that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So there's something about sacrifice. There is never a sacrifice without love or love without sacrifice. They are inseparable. When Jesus gave his life for us and suffered on the cross and heard the tormentors say he saved others he cannot save nobody to wipe his brow nobody to hold his hand nobody there that were with jesus when he suffered on the cross but he did it for the joy that was set before him because at that time he saw you and he saw me and it was worth the suffering so the very worst thing in history that the world has ever known or ever will know became the very best thing because it saves you and it saves me. Of all the gifts that heaven can bestow upon man, fellowship with Christ in his sufferings is the most weighty trust and the highest honor. You know, the little boy gave his lunch to Jesus, and the widow of Zarephath gave her last handful of flour and a few drops of oil to Elijah. And Jesus said there were many widows in Israel, but only God went to the widow in Zarephath outside of the church. And it's because she had faith and she was willing to listen to the voice of God and have faith and trust in him that she gave that little bit of flour and her last drop of oil. She was a destitute woman and she was esteemed very, very badly because widows had a bad name and her husband had died what did she have left to give well she gave it what a pitiful pitiful offering and I think of my son Micah when he was two years old he'd come into the kitchen door all smiling and in his sweaty little fist he held a real crushed up dandelion and he came in the kitchen and gave it to me 
all smiles. Was that little crushed dandelion worth anything? Not a thing, but to me, it meant everything in the world. Guess why? Because love transforms it. And it transformed it for me. And it transforms it for Jesus. He does not despise a broken and a contrite heart. In other words, the opposite of despise is to uh, take pleasure in it, to love it and appreciate it more than I did the little crushed dandelion. And so suffering takes on a whole different aspect uh, in our life. And the little boy that gave his lunch to Jesus... As Jesus told the disciples to feed the multitude, do we have any food here? And they said, there's one little boy with one loaf and five fishes. And they said to Jesus, what is that among so many? Well, you might say, what is in my hand? And what good is that among so many? The little boy just had one little lunch. The lady just had a little bit of flour and oil to give to Jesus, but they gave it. And so when that little boy gave his lunch to Jesus, Jesus was able to break it and feed the multitude. So if your heart is broken when you give it to Jesus, perhaps it's because it can feed a multitude, whereas just one little loaf can feed just one little boy. So if uh, whatever you have in your hand, let's give it to Jesus. If I'm lonely in the jungle, I can give that loneliness to Jesus every month. If I'm lonely every day, I have something to give to Jesus every day. And Jesus honors that and loves it. When the Lord <clears throat> intends to fill a soul, he first makes it empty. When he intends to enrich a soul, he first makes it poor. When he intends to exalt a soul, he first makes it sensible of its own miseries, want, and nothingness. And at this moment in my life, I'm empty. I'm poor. I, am sent, I really recognize my misery. I'm full of want, and I am nothing. I am a destitute woman. I don't know where to turn. I am skinny as a rail. But shortly after my experience in the kitchen, I got a call from my friend, and my friend said to me, Gail, we need you and the boys to go to Thailand to relieve some missionaries on the border that are running a school. They're going to be gone for three months on furlough, and you're perfect because you're a nurse, and you already, you three have your passports. In my heart, I didn't say it, but in my heart I'm saying, oh, no, not me. This is the worst time of my life. I am a destitute woman. I am skinny as a rail. This is my very worst time. There's nothing I can do in the mission field right now. I know God doesn't want me to do that. But out loud, I said, I'll pray about it. And so I went home, and we lived in Montana, and uh, this country block is one mile on each side, and I'm used to running that four miles, and so two miles I prayed, and then I run the last two miles, and I listened, and I didn't hear anything. And so then when I got to the back door, I heard, well, ask God for the money if he wants you to go, and I thought, oh, that's a good idea. I don't have any money. So I asked God for the money if he wants me to go. The next day, I'm driving my car, and my phone rings, and it's my friend. And she says, well, Gail, you never guess what. But we've got the money for you and your boys to go round trip to Thailand and your visas, and we have a box of medical supplies. And my mouth flew open, and I parked my car, and I said, that was you, Lord. And in less than 30 days, me and my two boys were on our way to Thailand uh, to work there and relieve at the border. <clears throat> There's not a burden, but he can remove. No darkness, but he can dispel. No weakness, but he can change to power. No fears, but he can calm. No worthy aspiration, but he can guide and justify. And I am a living testimony to that. I went a broken woman, and as I was going, I was healed because God filled my hands with work to do for him. And uh, God said he came to heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. And in Philippians 1, 6, he says uh, that uh, what he hath uh, begun, a good work in you, he will perform it. And so I can stand before you and say, there is no trace of heartbreak in me. There's only such joy because God is able to talk to me and I can hear his voice. So we're down, the boys and I, we 
do that three months. Many things happened in that time. And I didn't go back home because I met the Karen people. And the Karen people have been traumatized and tortured and killed in Burma for 70 years. And consequently, they flee into Thailand and they're in refugee camps along the border. And some flee into the mountains and all over the place. But uh, there at the border, they are in uh, these camps and little villages. And so as I talked to the students at that school, I realized they have fled from home and their villages have been burned and many of them have watched their parents get tortured and killed in front of their eyes. And I fall in love with the Karen people. We have not seen any kind of treatment like this in America. And so uh, I stayed 10 months at that school. And then I heard God calling me to go somewhere else because by then there's a lot of missionaries there at that school. So as I'm praying, three things happen. Well, first of all, somebody takes me to a village high in the mountains, in the jungle. Uh, so bad roads that I'm on the back of a motorbike with a guy and my chin is hitting the back of his shoulder so hard I know I bruised him well because I had a bruise on my chin. And we just went banging through the jungle and finally, after three or four hours, we got there. And at this village, I think, well, I'm happy in any village if this is where God wants me. And I went back and three things happened. Number one, somebody donate, donated me enough money to buy a truck a four-wheel drive truck. And then, number two, Bledja, the young Karen man that you see here in the purple, he heard the Lord calling him to work with us. He will come with us. And number three, a pastor came. He knew the area, and he showed us around. He said, there's 50 villages around your, this one, Biota, and many people don't know God, and so many never heard the name of Jesus. I knew this is where God wants us to go, so we moved in. We drove that truck in. Here's our truck. And uh, they had built us a bamboo hut uh, that we lived in. The bamboo was rotten. It smelled really bad because they hadn't cured long enough in the water and in the sun. But it was OK. And then this is our kitchen. This is the only thing we had in the kitchen. And this is my room where I sleep on the mat. Bamboo, by the way, is really comfortable to sleep on. It's very nice. And we're on the mountain, so everything is on the hill. And so um, we cook outside. I usually drop the pot right when it's ready. It goes down the hill. But, you know, I think that God doesn't really see me. What I'm doing, I'm so small, and it's just a small village, 27 huts at that time, and that probably Satan doesn't even care about what I'm doing. It's so insignificant. But I'm terribly wrong because if you don't meet the devil head on, that means you're going the same way, right? And so we met the devil head on. I realized this is a great work for God, and God has put me here. Uh, but the sad thing is we went to, the, um, to do our visa. We had to take the motorbikes because it's cheaper than the truck, and we had to go to North Thailand to the Burma border. And uh, on our way on a mountain, a truck came around the mountain the wrong side of the road and hit Braddy head on. And Micah and I are on another motorbike, and he veered over to us and hit us too. And we're all laid out on the highway. And I saw Brady hit that truck, and it was so hard I knew that he would die. But right then, the Lord spoke to me clearly and loudly, uh, in all things, give thanks, for this is the will of God for you. And so Brady's saying, turn the motorbike off, Mom. Turn it off, turn it off. I'm saying, oh, thank you, Lord. He can talk. He's thinking. He's talking. And then um, I checked him head to toe. Anyway, I think the guy will come out of the truck and be sympathetic. That guy came out of the truck, and he's furious. He's so angry because Brody dented the front of his truck. And then we have to get in the back of that truck, and he take us to the hospital. And there we are, Brody with a mangled left arm and a broken right leg and who knows what else, and us in the back of the truck, and he's going fast down the mountain, around the corner, blowing the horn, and he stops at the first checkpoint to get a police report because the Thai are always right, and the foreigner is always wrong. So he got that, took us on to the hospital, and there I've discovered Brady's tibia and fibula were dis uh, dislocated and broken, and his left arm was mashed and tangled. And so he needs to go to surgery. And so the doctor said, well, I'll fix the tibia, but the fibula only bears 20% of the weight, so I won't do that. And I said, well, do it. You will do it because you'll be in there anyway, and it just straighten it, but he didn't. Anyway, Braddy came out. Remember that the experience to be gained in the furnace of trial and affliction is worth all the pain that it costs. I didn't do that. And
man's soul. It's worth all the pain that it costs. And we were in pain. In fact, in that uh, hospital room, it was a, a suite of 24 men. It's a general hospital. It's right on the border of Burma and Thailand. And all the landmine victims are in there with their legs blown off and their arms blown off and these horrible injuries. And uh, there's my son out of surgery in intense pain. And the caregiver needs to stay with the patient in Thailand. And I have to sleep under the bed. And it, we only have a little backpack because we're just going to get our visa uh, extended and come back. But I'm there, I'm sleeping under the bed with my head on my backpack, and it's freezing cold. And plus, I'm concerned about my son. Finally, by the second night, a lady gave me a blanket. I didn't care if it was dirty or not, where it had been before. And wrapped up in that blanket, it was a really great relief. And so finally, that... Um, time was over and he had crutches with an elbow and with this arm and then we needed to go back and get our visa done and when we went back in the truck me driving we found out they didn't like our the way our passports were and our visas and they denied it and charged us two thousand dollars and I happened to have sixty thousand baht in my keeping because I was supposed to pay for that uh, hut, which wasn't worth that, but it was supposed to be paid, and I'd saved and everything, and so I gave that to them, and then I have to do, they say, uh, uh, fly out of the country and fly back in, and I, I will get my three months extension. So Bradley, with his long leg cast and his toes swollen, we get on a small plane, but to get on the plane, thank you, to get on the plane, he's got to sit in a little tiny seat, and his leg is, good thing he's not so tall. We went there, and they denied it. And then we came back to Thailand, and they denied it. And so then later, Bradley got discouraged, and he went back to America. It's the work of faith to rest in God in the darkest hour, to fear how, however sorely tried and tempest-tossed that our Father is at the helm. The eye of faith alone can look beyond the things of time to estimate aright the worth of eternal riches. And as my boys, later Micah left, they had been there for almost two years, uh, Micah left, the, the people, not the Karen people, but the people, uh, American people, kept telling me, Gail, it's too hard on you. You need to go back to America, and you need to just follow your boys. And so as they kept saying that to me, two verses came to mind. The Lord gave me two verses, one in um, uh, Deuteronomy 136 about Caleb that Caleb will possess the promised land, uh, he and his children. Why? Because he wholly followed the Lord. And in Hosea, it says, because my people have forgotten me and forgotten my law, I also will forget their children. So I have no choice. I need to know God's will. I'm there on God's will to begin with. So he's going to show me this time. So always at times like this, God gives me the rainbow of promise. Many whom the Lord could use will not move onward, hearing and obeying the one voice above all others. The connection with kindred and friends, the former habits and associations too often have so great an influence on God's servants that he can communicate with them but little knowledge of his purposes. And often, after a time, he sets them aside and he calls for others in their place. The Lord would do much more for his servants if they were wholly consecrated to him, esteeming his service above the ties of kindred and all other earthly associates. So in our troubles and trials, and we hold all our possessions in an open hand, our things that we love the most, our children, our family, our possessions, our future plans, and say, here it is, Lord, you do whatever you want to with it. It's not a sacrifice at all. It's the only way to bring joy. It's the only way to, to do the work that Jesus created us to do, to save souls for heaven. Move forward. Everything I heard then was, go forward, I will be with you. When he points out a work to be done in his name and with full faith, take up the work. You may not see the end from the beginning. Perplexities may surround you. Your brethren may tell you of the lions in the way. But nevertheless, go forward, saying, The Lord wants this work done, and I will not fail nor be discouraged. I will act my part. And you know, if we all did this, and the world, all the Seventh-day Adventists did this, Jesus can come. So forward we went. Glad Josh stayed with me. He's been with me for 12 whole years. And it doesn't matter how hard things get or how demon-possessed people get to us 
or the dangers, whenever it's a bad thing, we just cling all the tighter to Jesus and more determined to go forward because God is with us. And when we're in the center of his will, it's the safest place on earth and also the happiest place. Often, the Christian life is beset with dangers and duty seems hard to perform. Yet the voice of God speaks clearly, go forward. We should obey this command even though our eyes cannot penetrate the darkness. The obstacles that hinder our progress will never disappear before a halting, doubting spirit. Those who defer obedience till every shadow of uncertainty disappears and there remains no risk of failure or defeat will never obey at all. God had a lot of work for us to do. He preserves as a precious jewel everyone who gives all to him. You know, those that honor me, I will honor, God says. And when you're honored by God, you are honored. You don't need any human support. You don't need anybody to agree with you. You need just God on your side, and he will honor you. And since that time, many stories uh, have happened, and I skip a few because I feel like, what, how much time do I have? And so um, I will tell you this story because I feel like it's a message for the church. Because one Saturday night, I got a young man come to my house, and uh, it's raining, rainy season, and I'm alone that night. And he says, can you come and see my grandmother? She's sick. And so I said, oh, what's wrong with your grandmother? And he said, well, she swallowed a hunk of meat, and it won't go down. So I said, how long has it been there? And he said, three days. Now I'm really nervous because if it doesn't go down on its own in 24 hours, it's an emergency. You go to the hospital. You need a surgeon, a gastroenterologist to use special instruments because if you tear the esophagus, they bleed to death quickly. And then there's cartilage around the esophagus that tighten up when there's stress or when you're old. And this lady is 80 years old. Well, you could push it down, but you better go to the left or you block the trachea, and that's worse than blocking the esophagus. And so I'm really nervous, and I go to the school next door. It's sa Saturday night, so I tell the man I'll go in the morning. And I go to the school, and I never had uh, Internet there before, but I've got my computer, and I'm praying, and I want to send a message to my sister to pray. And so I didn't know if it went through or not, but I sent something. I came back, and I got what I thought I needed. I had a tongue retractor. I had bayonet forceps, and uh, I thought I need something to relax the muscle, and I just had Phenergan, like something for nausea, but it does relax a little bit. I had olive oil, maybe to lubricate, and off I went in the morning with this, met, with this young man. His name is Satu in the red shirt. When I get into the hut, I feel so sorry for this lady. She's lying on a pile of rags, and she's really, really hungry and really thirsty. She's not swallowed anything for three days. And people crowd in around you in those little huts all around, and everybody is all anxious and thinking I'm going to do something great. And so I tell them, I can't do this. This is way too much for people to do here in this village, and we can't go anywhere. But I will pray to the God I worship in heaven. And so I prayed. And I can't pray in Quran, but I can say the prayer in English, and then I can tell them what I said in Quran. And so after that, I give the shock, then the olive oil, which can't go anywhere. And then I get my bayonets and my tongue retractor, and she sits up, and I put that in, and I pull the tongue, and I have my on my head and I have my glasses on and I'm ready and I'm looking praying and I don't see anything and she chokes and so I start again give her a little rest and we start again I go further in and I've got my bayonets and I'm looking and looking and she chokes again and this time I think oh lord this lady is too much for her and then the third time this time I'm determined God will help me and I go even further and I pull and I'm looking and I've got my I'm ready to grab something and she really chokes and this time she chokes so hard that whole hunk of meat flies out of her mouth and it was pork no less and so then later much later I found out that my email did get to my sister and that was Sabbath morning for her because we're 11 12 hours ahead of her and she went to church and her whole church prayed for that lady and for me and for God's glory and not only in church did they pray but they prayed in Sabbath school too and so I want you to tell, tell you that you have a very important job to do when you pray for us things happen 
God can work through your prayers. It doesn't matter that we're half a world apart. God covers it instantly. So many lives have been uh, saved. This man uh, almost died on his way to the hospital. He has a blood disease and needs blood transfusions. If we don't get him there, he dies. And he testified that, oh, you have saved my life three times, and I'm so thankful I could never get there without you. And these two ladies, the older lady, the, the grandmother, she uh, almost died one time, and her stomach was hurting so bad she was in torture. And we had come to her village. Uh, we planned to go to another one, but God can direct you where you're needed. And I started an IV on her and gave her some medicine and prayed. And then we were on the porch treating the sick, treating the sick. And they're cooking the meal. They always cook the meal. And then this... Uh, lady stopped moaning and groaning and crying and when it was time to eat there she was sitting in the doorway and I said well how are you she said I'm well I don't have any pain in my stomach anymore and I'm hungry and so we ate together that day and then the daughter her name is Sheepa she has 10 children and every time she almost dies when she has children and it's quite miraculous. Three times we arrived at her village right on time when she had so much vomiting and diarrhea and dehydration that she wouldn't make it. So she was able to get the, um, and you know, in their primitive way, I believe that God can save them. We can't be there all the time and have a church there for them to go to. But when we go, we teach them. The people are worship the devil around us where we live. And uh, the children will all have strings tied around their necks. Uh, the wrist, the waist, and the ankles. And to them, that means it keeps the evil spirits away because they believe if the spirit goes uh, away from them, they get sick. And if it goes too far away from them, they die. So when somebody is sick, they do the devil chant to call the, the evil spirits back and to try to please the evil spirits, and they do sacrifices. They live in the jungle mountains of Thailand, much like they lived in Burma 100 years ago. And so... Uh, when we get a chance to tell them about the love of Jesus and that they don't, they don't have to go and give sacrifices of their precious cows and chickens and pigs are not precious, but they have to sacrifice these things because to please the devil, they don't have to do that. And many times we've been able to go into uh, the, the villages and talk to the people and cut these devil strings off. And it's a big step for these people because they feel like that is what's protecting their children and themselves from the devil, really, the, but the evil spirits, they call it. And so we've had some really blessed moments with these people and uh, getting the whole family to worship God. In fact, this one, I put it out of order maybe, they took all the trinkets and the devil worshiping things off the shelf. Every house has some corner or some shelf to put these things on to please the spirits and to give good luck. They destroyed all of that. Here's more people that we can cut the devil strings off of, this entire family in the next village. And there goes the, the trinkets. And, you know, I can walk through many villages in... Um, my area and I can see children and adults that should have died if I hadn't been there and I'm so thankful because Jesus did more healing than teaching but we also have worships with them and uh, teach them very simply because they cannot read or write the means in our possession may not seem to be sufficient for the work but if we will move forward in faith believing the all-sufficient power of God abundant resources will open before us. If the work be of God, he himself will provide the means for its accomplishment. He will reward honest, simple faith in him. The petitioner will have the blessings when he needs it most, and it will often exceed expectations. The prayers you offer in loneliness, in weariness, in trial, God answers always for our good. So after working several years in that bamboo hut where the babies don't wear diapers and the the adults spit and push it through the cracks of the bamboo, I pray to God, Lord, you know, if I could just have one small concrete building and I can have tile on the floor and I can wash it with Clorox and make it clean and I don't have to crawl around on the ground and get medicine and different supplies out of five different bags in my bamboo hut. And so God wants to answer 
big time. He doesn't want us to ask for small things. He wants to give us something big because God is a big God. And I don't have a little concrete building now. I have a 17-meter building with the living quarters on the right, if you see the door on the right, and the clinic on the left. Inside, oh, and we're in the midst of the jungle, and it's the highest point in our village. It was a miracle how we got that little piece of land to, to use. Can you turn it up? Can you turn the mic on? Anyway, as you see, this building, the blue roof is our church. It's okay. And then we even got a solar system. And the batteries ran out. We got new batteries, but uh, the guy thought our inverter was okay, so, but it wasn't. So our solar system is broken now. And then we got hydropower from the government, and, but it's broken more than it's working, so we don't have any power still. But um, still, the building is a blessing from God. We thank the Lord every day for this is perfect. We don't know how to do blueprints. We drew it out on a copy paper, and the builder came from the refugee camp and nailed it on post and built it. And this is what we got. This is our kitchen and living area. And to the right are two rooms. Mine is the one with the open door. And this is our clinic the busiest room of the house uh, where the patients come. These are my patient cards, and there's another half-filled box on the other side of the room because uh, one card for every patient, and every pa some patients come multiple times. And so people have come to our village from over 120 different villages, and they come for miles. Sometimes they rent a truck, and these are poor people, and they drive for two hours, and we say, why did you come here? You passed two clinics, and you could have gone to this hospital. And they say, well, we hear that you get well when you come here. So we came, and I say, Bledja and I, we say, it's not us. It's God. So we pray with the patience, and God is the one that does it. And this truck carried all our supplies in and out over hours and hours of bad roads to uh, build that clinic, and then it died. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about how God speaks to us because so many times we think, well, maybe God's finished with me in this area. Maybe I'm too old. Maybe so many different things. But time after time, God renews his contract with me. He wants me right there. And so for 12 years, I've been there one year. It was in 2014 when my truck died. And I had eaten into my retirement account, which I have to have three months before the year end, or I'm going to get kicked out of Thailand. I had eaten $5,000 out of that, and uh, my truck was dead. I came to America and thought, this might be it completely. Well, um, I preached 27 times in different places in two and a half months. And then John and Natalie got me into 3ABN. And I had an interview on 3ABN. And I don't ask for money because I just can't. It's not wrong, but I cannot. And so they ask you, and you have to fill out a form. So I need a truck, right? And so after that, I go back to Thailand. And uh, I have, um, no, 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 no. Let me back up. As soon as I came to America that year, I, my sister and I, we prayed on the living room floor, asked God to send us $5,000. And so the next day, Natalie called me, and she said, we'll never guess what, but somebody turned in $5,000 to your account. And I had miscalculated. I need $7,000, and $7,000 went in. And so we know God wants us there without a shadow of a doubt because it's hard to leave your family. And my mother was very old. She's passed away now. But every year that I've come, she was my home base. And every year it got harder for me to leave her. And so one year, uh, I was supposed to meet up with a girl that I'd given baptismal classes to. I'd given Bible studies to the whole family uh, long ago, like 25, 30 years ago. And she was an unwed pregnant mother at the time, drinking alcohol. And uh, somehow her family came to Jesus through those studies, and later she did too. And then she became a strong worker for God, having Bible studies in her house and following me as a missionary. And so miraculously, we were able to get together the night before I'm supposed to return to Thailand. 
And so I go to her house that night and so, so um, upset to leave my mother, okay. And uh, I walk into her house and she hands me an envelope and I open it, $25,000. I said, this is a mistake, I'm crying. And she said, no, 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 we had a field that we tried to sell, it's two years or more, and we couldn't sell the field. So I told my husband, why don't we tell the Lord that uh, if he sells this field, we'll give all the money to Gail for her work. And it sold right away. And she gave me that money. And this is a precious family. And then when I went home, I was able to share this with my mother and friends and family. And they know for sure without a shadow of a doubt, God wants me there. And then three and a half years ago, uh, I come for three solid months just to be with my mother. Because as you know, from the start of my testimony, my mother is uh, so special. My sister and I and mother are so close. But I spent three months with her, doing everything for her, but she's doing more for me because she's so inspirational. Coming to the end of those three months, I panic. I cannot leave her. Physically, I know, I tell the Lord, I cannot leave my mother. And then for three days I pray. And the last night, I stay up all night. I'm praying and reading. I'm crying. I'm doing all those usual things and saying, Lord, I cannot leave my mother. Uh, but I am willing uh, to stay here and never go back to Thailand, if that's your will. Or I'll go back to Thailand and come back for a short time. Or I'll go there and never come back. But you have to tell me what to do because I can't do it. Anyway, next morning, I'm eating breakfast with my mother. And she gets up and she says, I need to tell you something. And she went to her room, and she got Oswald Chambers' devotional book, which she reads every morning. And this is for August the 1st, and this is what it says. When Jesus had made an end of commanding his disciples, he departed to teach and preach in their cities. If when God said, go, you stayed because you were so concerned about your people at home, you robbed them of the teaching and preaching of Jesus Christ himself. When you obeyed and left all consequences to God, the Lord went into your city to teach. As long as you would not obey, you were in the way. Watch where you begin to debate and to put what you call duty in competition with your Lord's commands. I know he told me to go, but my duty is here. That means you don't believe that Jesus means what he says. This was just exactly an answer to that prayer, and it came through my mother, my poor, weak, sick, frail mother, which I thought I'd never see again. And so just then, the burden just rolled off my back, and God had spoken once again. And my mother says, you know, we don't have to be sad when you go, but I'm the happiest mother in the world to know that you are a missionary and you are working for God. I am the most fortunate mother, and we have every indication that God wants you there. And so with joy, I went. And for my final story, I want to tell you of a voice, of another voice of God in my life. After working for about seven years in Thailand, uh, we used to um, walk all the way in and out during rainy season. Rainy season is lasting four or five months, lately five whole months, and it's impossible to get anywhere except walk. And so we would be walking back and forth. We'd walk out. It would take six and a half hours because it's downhill, but it's scary downhill because some place is so steep. If you slip and fall, you'll roll just as if you're in the truck and go over the cliff. So anyway, walking out, and then it takes about seven and a half or eight hours to walk back in because you're going up. And it's so steep, you could reach out and touch the pavement right there as you're climbing the mountain. There's no rules about the grade. And so um, we're walking back into Biota one day afterwards, and usually I'm starving hungry, and I put the rice on immediately. But this day, I say to Bleja, is it cold today? He said, maybe a little, not really. And my fingers were numb. And so I thought, well, I'm never sick. I mean, I had drunk people's water, eat their food, sleep with them, do everything. I never had diarrhea. I never had a cold. I never had a cough or sore throat, nothing. So I think, I'm not sick. But I go to bed, and my temperature goes up to 103. Then it goes 104 and almost 105, and I quit taking it. And I'm the only medical person in my village, so I know what I have. I have dengue fever, 
and dengue fever, the symptoms are that you have a high, high fever and it rolls up and down. You hurt. Your arms and legs hurt. Your stomach cannot digest and it hurts. Your head is in a vice and you feel like you're going to die. And I have all those symptoms. But it's a virus because it comes off a mosquito, the infected mosquito, dengue fever. And so there I lay and Bledjaw comes to me and he says, Gail, you need to go to the doctor. I said, well, I can't go. I know what I have. You can't give an antibiotic. They can't treat anything when you go to the hospital. It's a virus. And so he left several times. He said, Gail, won't you go to the doctor? I said, it's raining. I'll never make it up that mountain. Okay, that was Thursday when it started. By Saturday night, it poured with rain all night long. And I'm thinking, to myself, after three days, I had blood in my urine, and with dengue fever, hemorrhagic phases comes on the fourth day. So that was a little strange to me, but I'm really sick, and so there I am, Saturday night, it rains like an Olympic-sized swimming pool, opened out on the roof all night long. And in the morning, Bledjaw comes to me, and he says, Gail, won't you go to the doctor? I said, Bledjaw, I cannot go to the doctor. Didn't you hear the rain all night long? And then he left. And just then, I heard God's voice, louder and clearer than ever, and it said this to me, Gail, you're being stubborn. I said, oh, Lord, yeah, I am being stubborn because Bledjaw always had good advice to give to me, and I'm refusing it. Lord, do you want me to go? And uh, just then, the school next door started up the most horrible music and when the teacher's leaving they have a party and sometimes we just have to leave because it's just like the devil right there in the air and that music started up as soon as I had those words with God I said okay Lord I'm going but you've got to help me and give me strength so I told Bled John he quickly got the neighbor boy to take me up uh, the second I had to walk the first mountain it's raining and he got this guy because he's got longer legs and he thinks he can get me up the mountain better and he's walking and I'm on walk that mountain and then I get on the back of the motorbike with Sase and we wreck three times and the first time I'm a little behind it's raining raining more than that anyway here's the chain on the back tire and the first time we wrecked that chain broke and I thought oh great that's the only way we can ever get out of here and I'm feeling like that's that's just bad news it's so bad. And then we wrecked the second time. And then by the third time, we're going straight up this bad part. And he's really giving it the gun. And he's going and going. And we're on this high ledge. And we fall off and go into the rut. And then we go over into the other rut. And we hit a rock. And I flip entirely head over heels off the back of the motorbike and land on my back in the mud. And there I am. And Bledjaw's coming around the corner, and Sase is hanging onto the motorbike, but it's very steep, and the motorbike is coming down, 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 until it's on my stomach, and the wheel is going round and round and round on my stomach, and my raincoat comes torn off, and my shirt is torn off, and Bledjaw is running, and I don't know what happened. And so somehow I got to the hospital that day. And I didn't think until much later, if that chain had not broken off the back of that motorbike, I would have really been torn to shreds because it's very sharp. It's those chains that go around that tire. And so God saved my life that day, at that time, because when I got to the hospital, this is what the hospital that I went to, what, I didn't take it that day, but this is the waiting room. There's people everywhere. You wait and wait and wait, and you're with all these people. And uh, then, finally, I got seen, and they checked my blood, and I didn't have malaria. Well, I know I don't have malaria, and I don't have dengue fever. And I think, oh, I had scrub typhus. Now, scrub typhus comes with a little louse or m mite or tick off of a rat, not near the village, but in the deep jungle, and we do walk everywhere. But if it's an infected with this typhus germ, uh, you will get this disease. And in that area, people are dying quickly with scrub typhus. And if you don't get treated with the proper medicine in seven days, chances are, good chance, you will die. I know, found out right then that there were other people dying, kidneys shut down, organs shutting down, and uh, dying. And this was my fourth day that I got treated and put on the right 
medication. So it behooves us all for our spiritual good, for our physical good, for our whole life to listen and hear the voice of God to our hearts. All who follow Christ will wear the crown of suffering. And heaven will be cheap enough if we get there through suffering, the Bible says. And in closing, I want to read you a poem. That means a lot to me because, you know, the Koran people, they weave. And my mom, Koran clothes are hand-woven by the people in my village. And they just do it thread by thread. It takes three days, at least full days, to make one of the skirts. And uh, so... It's hard work, and they do lovely work. And so in thinking about our message today, hearing God's voice and uniting ourselves to him through thick and thin, through our suffering, we are brought into the very presence of Jesus. So I don't want to shun and shrink from suffering for Jesus. More blessings come to us and others. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors. He worketh steadily. Oft times he weaves with sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget. He sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the pattern and explain the reasons why. For the dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hands as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. Should we pray? Okay, let's pray. You can kneel if you feel up to it. Dear Father in heaven, in our hearts today is planted a keen and earnest, urgent desire for us to hear the voice of God. And Lord, you can whisper to our conscience, may we be aware of that. You can speak to our joys, and may we know that you're the cause of all true joy. And you can shout in our pain, because you know that we're made of dust, and we're ignorant, we're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, and we need your voice, we need your shout to wake us up, out of the wrong direction that we might be taking or the self-serving or the um, materialistic, worldly, loving, pleasure-seeking mess that we are. I pray, Lord, that you will save us from our sins and from our wretchedness. And may we see your face as never before. And please help us not to miss your lovely voice, which comes to us to just totally, quickly, suddenly, stunningly relieve us of our heavy burdens and give us the best uh, joy and love and forgiveness. Because with you, Lord, is fullness of joy. You came that we could have life and have it more abundantly. And not only that, it's not about us, but when we get to heaven, Lord, we want souls to be there that can come to us and say, thank you, because of you, I'm here. And uh, you left your comforts. You did all this for me, and I'm here. But, Lord, we don't want to hear in that day people that come and said, why didn't you tell me? I was right there. You were right there, and you never told me, and now I'm lost, eternally lost. So, Lord, we have these two choices in our life, and today we choose you. We're going to step out in faith. We're going to hold all of our experiences, every uh, possession and um, future plan in our hand, open hand, that you can take it, you can let it drop, or you can give us more. We want to trust you completely with everything. And so that's our desire today and our prayer. And we want to thank you for it because it delights you to do this for us. In Jesus' name, amen.